Yeah, just huddle all together. <laughs> good thing we're a close family. All right, folks, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. A uh, couple of announcements before we get started. Let's see what they are. Uh, okay, uh, you know about the offering box uh, <coughs> to the door. Now, uh, this morning we're going to talk about knowledge and uh, wisdom and understanding. And... Um, uh, no, uh, knowledge is um, you're supposed to go uh, soul winning and knocking on doors, you know, working at uh, leading people to Christ. Wisdom tells you that when um, the wind chill factor is below zero, people aren't going to want to stand up. <laughs> on the door. Okay, uh, I'm willing to freeze for the Lord all, all I need to, but they're not going to be willing, right? You know, the, the, the folks. So we're going to hold off on soul winning for uh, for today, unfortunately, but we. But let's spend the time praying for the, the, those folks and for the folks who aren't saved, okay? Amen. All right. Um, our next Sunday evening concert, March the 3rd, uh, 6 p.m. We're, we're working on uh, our songs. We encourage everybody to come. A great time of fellowship and singing praises to the Lord and uh, really looking forward to it. And then our uh, next Good Friday service, uh, March the 29th at uh, 7 p.m. And, and um, I'm going to have... Um, couple things to say about um, as we get closer about Good Friday and, and my thoughts on that. Uh, and um, you also notice a Bible study is not up there. Um, I'm going to talk about that later uh, toward the end of the service. I mean the, the, the sermon, okay? All right, so let's please stand and sing Lord's praises.
this opportunity that you've given us to come together to uh, sing songs unto you, to uh, be here for each other, to uh, uh, learn from your word, uh, to uh, provoke each other into love and the good works. And please guide us. We want this service to be pleasing to you. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I know. I forgot I have to bring my blanket. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where it is. I don't know. It took it home to watch. Is it advancing?
I sure like that song. I love my evil man. I really like that song. Okay, prayer need Thanksgiving. Uh, first, um, let's pray for warmer weather. <laughs> um, I will, uh, uh, apparently the furnace doesn't seem to be working correctly. Uh, so um, uh, we thought we had it going, so we're going to uh, call uh, uh, Paul later and see if he can, uh, see what we can do about it to get it uh, working. And today's a, an especially cold day, so, but still yet it's not blowing anything, so we'll see what we can do about that. I'm going to get some extra heaters in that too this, uh, uh, this week uh, to make sure that you know, we have that covered. Okay, but other than that, but let's be thankful that we have a place to worship and all. You know, a lot of folks canceled today, uh, their services today. I saw that. Uh, and uh, look at you all here this morning. Huh? Amen. 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 And we just praise God for it. We're not asking for a gold star. We just praise God. Okay. All right, so what do we have this morning? Prayers we need praise. Yes, Miss Carol. I have a prayer. I'm here. Yes, yeah, back from the dead. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You brought that right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, praise God. So yes, that, amen. You're doing better, huh? Right now. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, thank God for what he's done for Carol and, and uh, continue praise for uh, prayers for, for healing. All right, what else do we have? Melanie. My friend from the geriatric center passed away. Her name is Carol. Carol, okay. And they really hit me, but I know that's God's plan to take her so she won't have to suffer anymore. Okay. All right, so let's pray I for Melanie. And, uh, she lost her friend Carol and for um, Carol's um, family and friends and all. Yeah, it yeah. really hit me bad. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's pray for Melanie. Okay, what else do we have? Yes. Um, Jesse Bowie's yeah. lady, the granny Daryl and Sammy, they're both sick today. Oh, yeah, yeah. They had a really high fever. It went down now, I guess, and Sammy has a bad cold. Okay, so let's pray for Daryl and Sammy. Uh, uh, Lord will heal them and, and make them well. Okay, what else do we have? Jim. I have three things. Three things. Renee's been having migraine headaches the last couple of weeks. Oh, so it's, okay. It's so it's been let's an pray. on and off thing for her. Okay. Uh, number two. My brother-in-law is having surgery tomorrow, got torn rotator cuff. Okay. Continued prayer for my sister Carolyn Cardwell. Um, they, it was cancer spread to the thyroid, yeah. but thyroid. she's going to have surgery just to remove a nodule, so it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, so uh, let's pray for Renee, that the Lord will heal, heal her of these migraines. Uh, for Jim's uh, brother-in-law, uh, what's his first name? Ron Bennett. Oh, Ron. It's Renee's brother. Okay. Uh, 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 it's going to have surgery, rotate a cuff, and let's continue, please, to pray for um, Jim's uh, sister, Carolyn Carwell. She's uh, dealing with this cancer. Okay. What else do we have? Marilyn. Zach is away talking. Zach is away talking. Well, praise God for that. He has to have more surgeries. I don't know what kind. You know, but he seems to be on the mend. I don't know. Looks like it's going to be a long road, though. Yeah, so let, let's uh, continue to pray for uh, Zach. I did tell the young boys, don't forget to thank God for answering your prayers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. No doubt about that. All right, what else? Hey. I could do the continued prayers for my uncle. They are sending him tomorrow from Pittsburgh back here to the geriatric. Oh, okay. Which is nice to save with trying to travel and oh, yeah, no and whatnot. Doubt. No but doubt. just hoping he'll do the therapy and rehab <coughs> and get what he needs there. Okay, so continue prayers for uh, for Amy's uncle. We've been praying for. Yeah, so uh, he had surgery, right? Yeah, and that he had went a well. Major bypass done on his leg. Yeah, and that went okay, I think. It, it did. did. Yeah. Once he went to Pittsburgh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want anybody, I know, let's see, uh, Virgil and Neymar here uh, today. Anyone know how um, patient's surgery went? Uh, I didn't see a whole lot about that. We'll have to get a hold of uh, Let's see. I mean, I saw some information, so it's not like we don't know anything, but I just, just wondered. Okay, anything else? Yeah, 
Dan's mother could use some prayer. She's got a bad earache. Yeah. Off and on for a long bad time. Earache. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's pray for Dan's mom. Uh, Not going good. With, uh, Having an ear issue here. Nose and everything? Yeah. Yes. Well, they sure are interconnected. Yeah, so let's pray for her. Anything else? Thank God for the kids. Oh, yeah. yeah of thank course, God. thank God for the Money. children. Okay. And unspoken for Dwayne. Dan. Praise God, we have some uh, new ones joining us. There. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas and I go way back. And uh, yeah, it's so much so that I didn't recognize him when he came in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We met each other in mercy. Yeah, and then, and then, and then, and then wait, what did you mean? Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. So we have two Sarahs here today. Yeah. 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 Sarah, so thank you, thank you for, for being here this morning. All right, so anything else? I have one other. Uh, well, you already uh, had it. I have <laughs> yeah. this friend for the, the homeless out there, as cold as it is. Oh, man. yeah, for we sure. Have, we should have door out of the wind. I mean, yeah, much. no doubt about it. If we, if we know of anyone like that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we need to do something to help them, for mm -hmm. sure. So let's make sure. Okay. I'm supposed to have a test on Thursday at the hospital, and I'm a Got to keep it in God's hands. Yeah. Okay, so let's pray for nervous. Melanie as well. Uh, she's having a test on Thursday. Okay. We're going to talk about praying today as well, briefly. Uh, so, okay. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, and, and uh, we pray that your name will always be hallowed. Um, uh, we know that um, you uh, have. You already knew what uh, the folks were going to ask and, and state and thank you for even before you did. So, Father, we ask you that if it be your will that you heal all those who are in need of healing, comfort those who are in need of comforting, and, uh, all to your glory. And, Father, please use these situations uh, to, uh, to open the eyes of anyone involved who isn't saved to their need for salvation and that there's only one way to be saved, and that is to believe on your son, to trust what he did on the cross as a complete payment for our sins. Now, Father, please guide the junior church teachers, um, help them to teach correctly, and, and um, uh, please uh, be with the children, help them to be well-behaved and to, uh, uh, to pay attention and to learn. And Father, fill, please fill me with your spirit so that only your truth comes out of my mouth, the only truth there is. Father, we ask you, um, uh, we want to uh, live by these truths, so please write them on our hearts so that we will. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah Junior Church. Junior Church. Time for Junior Church. Junior Church is only for children, not adults acting like children. <laughs> In that case, I would be going back. Carol said she wants to go to Yeah. <laughs> Carol wants to go. All right. All right, everyone have a bulletin and a Bible? You're going to need a bulletin and you're going to need a Bible. All right. Now, Okay, we are beginning a new sermon series this morning. The title uh, on Colossians, the book of Colossians. And the title of the message this morning is A Generation of Dumbed Down Churches. A Generation of Dumbed Down Churches. Now, in case you did not know it, the Steelers are playing tomorrow. They were supposed to play today, but, um, you know... Apparently there's some state of emergency or something. I don't know, a little bit of snow, like a couple of feet or something. Uh, but, uh, so they decided to postpone it until tomorrow. They're playing, believe it or not, in a wild card game, which means they're in the playoffs. Now, some of you might be aware that head coach Mike Tomlin has a favorite expression. He says, the standard is the standard. 
And the slogan seems to convey this idea that they have high standards and they want to strive for those high standards. However, the Steelers have not won a playoff game since 2017 and have only won three playoff games in the last 10 years. But Coach Tomlin is heralded as a great coach because he has never had a losing season. That has led many Steeler fans to say that the standard must have been lowered greatly. The striving for a Super Bowl victory has been replaced well with, well, at least we didn't have a losing season. And as a matter of fact, even former Steelers quarterback, future Hall of Famer, Ben Roethlisberger recently said, maybe the tradition of the Steelers is done. Now, one way to avoid disappointment is to lower your standards. It's to lower the bar. We've seen this in churches throughout the United States. Let's cut out what we're doing so that we're not disappointed when no one shows up for what we're doing. And it's understandable because after a while it seems like beating a dead horse. You know, you're going to only ask people to do things so many times before you say, okay, I get it. You know, it's not happening. So the standard is lowered. What is expected is lowered. And everyone is happier, at least not as disappointed. Everyone is happier except for those who know it's not right. I put this in your bulletin. This morning, we learned from God through Paul that we need to keep the standard up to what God expects from us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So please turn to Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Colossians chapter 1. So thankful everyone's here this morning. Let's pray for those who aren't. <coughs> who probably wanted to be here, but, but for something stood in their way. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. Everyone there? All right, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which at our Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So we're studying the book of Colossians this morning. And first, please let me explain what this book is. And as I put in your bulletin, this book is an epistle. And I put this, this uh, an epistle is a long letter. Okay, so Paul wrote letters to the different churches, you know, in the different areas, right? And as I put this, is letters being written from Paul and Timotheus, or Timothy, unto the saints and faithful brethren, the Bible says, in Christ, who are at Colossae. Okay? So, uh, now, notice something else I put in your bulletin. When the Bible uses the word saint, and if you look at it, there are many times the, word, the Bible uses the word saint uh, in the New Testament. It's always referring to those who are saved. Okay? It's always referring to those who are saved. The Bible does not use the word saint uh, to single out some special kind of Christian. You know, like how the Catholic Church does. You know, they'll, they'll say, hey, this person was really special, uh, and after they're dead and gone for a long time, usually, uh, we're going to elevate them to sainthood. Okay? Um, uh, and that, the Bible doesn't do that. Uh, the Bible refers to believers as being saints. You know, those who are sanctified by the blood of Christ. So, if you're saved this morning, what does that mean? You are a saint. I am a saint. Okay? It doesn't mean we believe saint, or we act saintly, but we are saints. Okay? Now, notice he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Now, so Colossae is where they lived, and therefore those people who lived in Colossae were known as Colossians, right? And that's why this book is called uh, the, uh, an epistle to, or the book of Colossians. It's an epistle to the Colossians. And notice that Paul's addressing the letter to the faithful brethren. Now the word faithful can have different meanings, and, and it has two main meanings. Sometimes it means to someone who has faith, right? Anyone who believes, anyone who is saved, 
it, uh, is a believer is faithful, meaning that they have faith, <coughs> meaning that they believe. But the word faithful can also mean uh, worthy of putting your faith in. Someone who's reliable, right? Someone who is trustworthy. So if we say we have a faithful member of our church, uh, not only are we saying they're a believer, but we're saying you can count on them. You know, you can count on them to come to the services. You can count on them to, to be there when they're needed, to help out, all these different things. So sometimes we hear the word faithful, we think of someone as being reliable, right? Someone who's trustworthy. Someone who's always there for you. Okay. Now look at verse 3. We give thanks to God and to and the Father of the Lord. I'm sorry. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same, right? So Paul's saying basically that we've been praying, praying always for you. We've been praying a lot for you. And we, we pray always for you, you church at Colossae, you, you Colossians. Matter of fact, look at verse down, down to verse 9 for a moment. <coughs> for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all <coughs> wisdom and spiritual understanding. So two times here, Paul is saying that he and Timotheus or Timothy, you know, spend a lot of time praying for them. Praying always for them. But I want to say this, that sometimes I think that uh, people have a tendency to say, uh, I'll pray for you or I'm praying for you when we're really not. Or they're really not, you know. Uh, and it's easy to do. Someone says, hey, I have this going on. Could you pray for me? And you say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll pray for you. And then what happens? Life. <coughs> right? And you get distracted and you forget. So what I find is important for me to do is that if I say I'm going to pray for somebody, that I do it right then and there. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So that I don't forget. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be one of these guys that say I'll pray for you and then I go. Okay. So here's the thing. Is the Bible true? Yes. Is yeah. the Bible right? Absolutely. Right? Every word of it, right? No, so no. when Paul says that he and Tim, when Paul and Timothy say that they've been praying always for them, what does that mean? They've been praying always for them. Okay? All right. And so also notice the word always. So I need to always pray for you all. Right? Every day you, you all need to be in my prayers. And I pray that every day I'm in your prayers. Amen. That you pray for me. Okay. So look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his wisdom and all wisdom, I'm sorry, of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay, so now Paul is giving us uh, some idea here, God through Paul is, of what he considered um, a, some strong points of the church at Colossae, right? Of the Colossians. And also some things that they needed to work on. I put this in your bulletin. The strength that we see of the saints at Colossae was their love. Over and over again, Paul praises them for their love, that their love, for their loving people, for the loving of the saints, for loving others. Apparently, they were very loving people, 
and didn't keep their love to themselves. They showed it, right? They demonstrated it. And he says, look, even Epaphras told us of your love. We already knew about it, but he reiterated that to us. He confirmed it to us, how loving you are. And over and over, he talks about how, what a loving people these folks were. I also put this in your bulletin, but the thing that he wants them to work on and the thing that he's praying for them is, look what it says, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay? So here we have three words. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Those three words are used throughout the Proverbs. God talks about, uh, over and over again, about these three important elements. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And what do they all have to do with learning? Right? They all have to do with learning. Now, look at verse 10. That ye might be, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, does everyone here want to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing? Amen. Absolutely. Amen? Do you? Or, or do you want to walk... Uh, or do you want to walk worthy of the Lord unto some pleasing? No. Some pleasing or all pleasing? Oh. All pleasing, right? Do you want to be fruitful in every good work? Amen. Or do you want to be fruitful in some works? Or maybe a little bit of work, that's enough. Or do you want to be fruitful in all works? All, all, works. all works, right? And increasing in the knowledge of God. So what is Paul saying to them? Hey, Colossians. You are very loving people. You're a very loving church. You have a lot of love. And I'm hearing about your love. How you're loving you know, all these different people. But he says, look, you also need knowledge with that. Right? I mean, if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to abound in every good work, if you're going to work, walk worthy of the Lord, love is important. Love is crucial. And it's critical. What did Paul say? Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is a giving love, I become a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. So we know that love is the key, right? But love is not enough. He's saying you need to add to that knowledge. You need to get knowledge. You need wisdom. You need understanding. He says, man, I, I'm thrilled at how loving you are. Hey, but I don't want to see that love go to waste. Get the knowledge. Right? Combine knowledge and love. And that will produce action. That will produce the right action. That's what God wants to happen. So we see in 2 Peter on the screen here, verse 1 talks about this as well, verses 5 through 9. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, <laughs> and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And like I said, charity is, is a giving love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Okay, so now notice something. He says, that the reason he says add to your faith is because it's faith that saves you, right? So without that, that saving faith of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the rest of it doesn't matter. What does the Bible say? For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, right? It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, so it's that faith that, that, um, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ that then saves you. But I put this in your bulletin. So once you are saved, add to your faith virtue. Not so that you'll be more saved. There is no such thing. But so that you'll be more productive on this earth. 
So the question is, what does virtue mean? And I put this in your sermon notes. Well, virtue has to do with living a good life, and it also has to do with power. It says to add to faith virtue and virtue knowledge. So what he's saying is you need to grow in your knowledge. You need to learn new things. You need to gain knowledge. And then he says, add to knowledge temperance. Now I put this in your sermon notes. Temperance is basically being able to control yourself, being tempered or under control. So you hear people say, he lost his temper, right? What does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, he lost his uh, self-control. Now, that's what people usually say, right? Uh, I would say, no, actually you didn't lose your control at all. What you did is controlled yourself to be angry. <laughs> you see? See my point? Uh, so in other words, if, I, if someone says to me, and I'm really angry at them, and I really fly off the handle, so to speak, and let them have it, did I control myself to do that, or did someone else control me to do it? I controlled myself to do it. So what I did was I controlled myself irrationally. I controlled myself in an ungodly way. Okay? So we're to have this temperance to control ourselves in a godly way. So he says, add to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and brother kindliness charity. Okay. So, and when we're to gain knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, look, you need to have knowledge, you need to back it up. If you're going to be fruitful, you need to have virtue, and temperance, and knowledge, and, and then, but what, what is the, the, like the icing on the cake for it all? And that is love. You know, with love, that, that then the rest of that is put into action. Why do we go knocking on doors? Except when it's you know freezing cold. Why do we go knocking on doors? Because we love. Right. And why do we do it? Because we love. You see? If we didn't care about people, then why would we do it? Because we love God. He tells us to do it. You know, why do we share the gospel with others? Why why do you know? It's, why do we want to help people to grow in the faith? It's because of love. Okay. And look, you know, Paul says, you know, you can have all these things, but without love, you're nothing. You know, as the Doobie Brothers say, without love, where would you be now? <laughs> right. Nothing. Because then, you know, First Corinthians chapter thirteen. As I quoted a little bit earlier, you know, if I have charity, I am nothing. So I put this in your sermon. Notes. So we're not saying that love is not important. We're not saying that charity is not important. But what we are saying is that to serve God effectively, you must have both knowledge and love. You have to have both. However, there is this whole movement of churches today that are very lean in the knowledge department. But they sure do love. The love sure does flow. And look, that's great. But they need to get the book of Colossians out and read it and let God talk to them uh, about that. It's fantastic that you're loving. But you need to get into the book. You need to study God's word. You need to study to show yourself approved unto God. You know, you need to add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge because you don't want to be unfruitful. So you need to have knowledge, you need to have wisdom, you need to have understanding. And oh, by the way, did I mention knowledge? And that's essentially what Paul is saying today. And over and over again, he's telling them they need to learn more. The problem is, is this is downplayed in many, many churches today. Many churches want you to have an experience, right? They're inviting you to an experience. You go to church to have a religious experience, an emotional experience. 
Maybe you, 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 know, you go there and then you feel closer to God or you, you come out and you feel more recharged, you know, like you recharged your spiritual battery or something. And you know what? That's great. That, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. But you have to ask yourself, what did I learn? What did I learn? So I'm not against feeling. I'm not against your feeling closer to God, but you know what? You know how you really get closer to God? By knowing Him. Right? Who are, who are you the closest to? The ones you know. <clears throat> and, right? Right? The ones you know are the ones you're closest to. Right? No one knows me like Sandy does. Uh, you know, uh, no one knows Sandy like I do. You know? And no one knows us better than God. God knows me better than I do. So I said, you better get the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding. He says this so many times because it's so important. So you say, well, what do these words mean? Well, knowledge is, means to know something, right? Look at the first four letters of knowledge. K-N-O-W. It means to know. When you don't know what the Bible says, when you don't know what Genesis is about and Exodus is about and Leviticus, Leviticus is not about, then you're not going to be fruitful. That's what Paul is saying. Some might say, oh, but that doesn't matter. You know, it's just about love. But what does the Bible tell us? You're not going to be fruitful if you don't know the Bible. You're not going to be fruitful if you don't have the knowledge. That's not me saying this. That's Paul, God through Paul saying this. Because you know what? A lot of people have a lot of love and not a lot of knowledge. And they go out and do things for God, but they don't do the right things for God. Because they don't know any better. Because they're not doing what God is telling them to do. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of this. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, I won't, uh, of course I'm not going to mention your names right now. But we had a situation uh, a few years ago where um, um, we were going to go to a local nursing home to, um, um, to um, you know, meet with uh, the, the residents there. And um, my thought was, because you know, I was really getting convicted about soul winning and all, my thought was, here we have people lying there pretty much waiting to die. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but they are. God only knows how many of them are saved or who aren't saved. What we need to go there as it's fine, sure, give them the socks, you know, give them socks uh, that, you know, that would be very nice. But let's share the gospel with them too. For anyone who's able to hear, anyone who's, you know, lucid enough to be able to understand. But no, that isn't what some folks want. They wanted Santa Claus to come. And they wanted the sock, and that was it. Now you tell me something. Santa Claus comes walking in the room and I'm trying to share the gospel with them, who are they going to pay attention to, me or Santa Claus? <laughs> See my point? Santa Claus! Not me! And what a wasted opportunity if we have the attention of someone because we're handing them something and we don't share the gospel with them. Amen. Why? And so I said, no, no. I, if we're going to do this, Santa Claus isn't coming. The focus is going to be on the gospel. And, you know, we can give the stuff that's a nice... And, you know, uh, you know, some folks left over that. That's love without knowledge. You see? See the importance? <clears throat> there are a lot of loving preachers that preach a lot of false doctrine. Not because they want to teach false doctrine... Not because they're trying to teach false doctrine, but because they haven't studied. And I'm not talking about going off to some Bible college. I'm talking about they haven't cracked open the Bible enough and read it enough to see what it says. You see? So they just didn't study the book enough. 
but they're very loving. They mean well, but they're leading people astray. So look at verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Now, you know, it, it's interesting. Some people debate whether it's better to have grown up in a Christian home where the Bible is read, you know, where they go to a church where they're taught the Bible, and all, you know, just like these children back, uh, you know, in, in the junior church room and all. Whether it's better to have had that experience or to have lived a life of sin, you know, for a while into your adulthood and then get saved. To have a better testimony, of, you know. You know, uh, in other words, the longer I wait and the more that I've sinned, the more wrong I've done, <clears throat> you know, the, the more radical the testimony where I can tell you, I used to do this, that, and the other, and now I'm changed. But you're probably going to get even more fruit than <clears throat> fruit. Uh, the person is going to be more fruitful if they grew up learning the Bible and all. All along the way. I'm not talking about going and sitting in a church and learning nothing. I'm talking about someone, a child learning the Bible all along the way, getting saved. And You see what I'm getting? Then someone who's into their adulthood and getting saved then. And why? Because the person who's older has to play catch up. You see my point? Whereas this person has learned all along the way. And, um, and, and they have, so, you know, they've learned so much more. And so the person who gets saved in the 30s or 40s or 50s, praise God they're saved. They just have more, a lot more studying to do to catch up. Now, I will say this much. I've seen people who got saved and in a year's time knew more about the Bible than many of the people in, in their church yeah, because they studied, they read it, and they read it, and they read it. Right. You know, and sometimes people say, oh, but man, that's not, it's not about how much you know. It's not about, that, is that what you think it's about? You know, just about how much knowledge you can have? And what good is that, they'll say, you know? Uh, it's just about telling people about Jesus, about him being crucified and nothing else. Well, you know, the Apostle Paul got saved later in life, right? But he studied the Bible from the time he was yay high, right? He was raised to be a Pharisee. You know, he knew the scripture backwards, forwards, and sideways. So he, he knew it. He just wasn't saved. He didn't believe on the Lord Jesus until the Lord Jesus made himself uh, abundantly clear to him. So look, I'm not looking down on people who get saved later. I'm one of them. But why would it be better to be saved later than earlier? You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. The sooner the better. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Why would we want to do a bunch of dumb things to later be able to talk about it? But you know it's a more you know it's a more powerful testimony? Jesus saves. Yeah, the Lord Jesus went to the cross and died for us and paid for our sins. But I put this in your bulletin. Your testimony might get people's attention. And I know, uh, you know, I, fo I know folks in our, our congregation who have a powerful testimony of what God has done for them. And it's great. And when they share it, it gets people's attention. But as I put, your testimony will not save people. The gospel saves so if we are sharing, you want to know what God did for me. I used to do this, and now, you know, look what he did. We better, at some point, share the gospel. Because otherwise, it, it's kind of like, um, look what this therapist did for me. You know, I used to do this, that, and the other, and not, I'm not anymore. You see my point? The point is, in the gospel, isn't our changed behavior. The point of the gospel is that there's only one way to heaven. And that is Jesus. But our changed behavior can get people's attention. We can use it as a vehicle. 
right? The gospel is not about you and me. The gospel is about Jesus. The gospel is about his death, burial, and resurrection. And we can preach that whether we had a, a rough upbringing or not. We can preach that whether we got ourselves into all kinds of things or not. But if your testimony can help someone to get saved, fantastic. But see, the problem is, is that this attitude of downplaying knowledge, that knowledge doesn't matter, that knowledge isn't important, do you know what it leads to? It leads to what we have today, a generation of dumbed-down churches and dumbed-down Christians. And as a result, they are easily deceived. Because the one who doesn't know the Bible is tossed, you know, by every wind. They're tossed to and fro, right? They're not grounded. They're not rooted in the Word. But when you know the Scripture, what happens? You hear someone say something that isn't scriptural, and, you know, and you're, you're kind of like a dog. You know, when a dog hears something, he doesn't know what it is. He kind of does this. You know, turns his head. Yeah, you do that. You think, and then Scripture comes to mind. Wait a minute, that's wrong. You know how I know it's wrong? Because of God's Word says so. So what happens when you study God's Word is you develop a scriptural nonsense filter. You know? You develop a... a um, uh, God, God guides you. Because, let me ask you something. Is Scripture going to come to mind if you don't read it? No. no. Right? Is Scripture going to come to mind if you don't study it? No. No, no of course not. And, and so the only way... So look, if... The, the only way you know from one week to the next if what I'm saying to you is true is if you study your Bible. Otherwise, I could make up things all day long and you'd say, yeah, sure, whatever you say, you must know what you're talking about because you're standing up here before and behind the podium. Right? But it could be all a bunch of nonsense. Look what I put in your bulletin. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Knowledge is knowing things. Yes, it's important to know things, uh, to know what the Bible says. Wisdom is when you not only know things, but you can actually apply those things in your life. That's what wisdom is. It's knowing how to apply those things in your life. And that's what preaching is meant to do. It's meant to uh, show you how you can use the Scripture in your life. How you can apply it in your, in your situations, in your daily living. And notice what I put, the third thing. Understanding is when not only you know things, not only do you apply things, but you also understand the why. Right? So is it possible to have knowledge of something and wisdom of something without having the understanding? Absolutely. Sure it is. So we might tell our children, for example, hey children, don't drink alcohol because the Bible says what does the Bible say about alcohol? What can happen? Thy eye shall behold strange women, and thy mouth shall utter perverse things when you drink alcohol. So children, stay away from alcohol. And they might look at you and say, okay, well, that's what the Bible says. That's what I'm going to do. Because the Bible's warning me, and I want to be wise. But then the understanding comes into play when they understand what it means to behold a strange woman. They, when they understand what perverse things coming out of your mouth means. And so, so now, okay, now I'm getting the why. I'm understanding why this is, is important. Uh, they comprehend. But at first, you know, uh, they're like, babe, so one of my favorite expressions for parents with children uh, at first, uh, you know, in their first, as their first teaching, is because I say so, right? And why, why do you, am I, do I have to do this? Because I say so. Now, if they can understand the why, well, you see, 
son, because if you don't do this, this will happen, and then this will happen. Okay, yeah, I get it. Then you don't have to say because I say so, because they'll get the explanation. But it's when they don't get the explanation that they have to understand, because I say so is enough. Right? So right now, stay away from the booze, young children, because God says so. You understand more why later as you get older. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to young children. This applies to adults first learning the Bible as well. Amen. I don't can't quite get why God says this, but God says this, so I'm going to obey it. Because He says so. You follow me? Now, later on, I might develop more of an understanding why. Okay. All right. So we see here in Scripture, knowledge is being emphasized. So if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to win people to Christ, if you're going to do a lot of good for God, you need to be a loving person. Right? You need to be a loving person. 1 Corinthians 13 makes that very clear. But okay, so let's keep reading. Verse 10 again. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious, glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Okay, so now he, uh, let's, let's talk about these attributes that he's adding to this, okay? So not only do you need love, not only do you need knowledge, but he's saying that you need to be a strong person. And, uh, and obviously the opposite of strength is weakness, right? So look, look what I put in your sermon. Notes. The, Bible, uh, the Bible says, uh, well, to be strong means um, uh, to resist sin, right? Strength is when we resist temptation. Strength is when we stand firm, hold our ground, and refuse to give in to temptation. That's what he's talking about there. Then patience, he adds to this. And so that is, uh, you know, uh, related to endurance and diligence. So we're to continue even though we're not getting what we want right now. We're to be patient and continue on and continue on. Right? It, it, it can take longer than we hoped for, but we continue on because we're patient. And what does it mean to be long-suffering? It means that we're tolerant. We don't just blow up at people because that, you know, they're doing something that uh, we don't like. You know, that's irritating to us. You know, we're, 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 um, you know, we're tolerant of these things. You know, maybe your spouse does something that you don't like so much. Uh, or, or maybe uh, you do something that they don't like so much. What helps a marriage greatly? Long-suffering. Right? You know, uh, you, um, you uh, learn to tolerate each other's things that um, you're not so thrilled with. I'm not talking about somebody beating you over the head with a club. You know, right? You know, but you notice they, they kind of suck their teeth after they eat or something. I don't want to say Sam off. But, you know, they, they, do, they do that kind of thing. You think, oh, man, I don't like that. Uh, but, you know, you, you tolerate. Uh, and then notice this. Long-suffering with joyfulness. He's saying be cheerful about it. Okay? So, I added this to your sermon notes. We need to have knowledge if we're going to be a well-grounded, stable church. Amen? Does everyone agree with that? Amen. We need to have knowledge if we're going to be fruitful. How else are we to know what God wants us to do? How else are we to have an answer? You know, very often people will say, well, I don't know about sharing the gospel with people. You know, uh, I'm not just talking about, I mean, in any situation. Because I don't know what to say if they ask a question. What is the solution to that? Right. Read this. Then you'll have the answer. You see? I mean, I, uh, honestly, I, I, I think sometimes, I think some, I, I'm not addressing this to you all, but I think sometimes people think that the pastor is the only one that's able to understand this. You know, that's like some Catholic idea, you know? You know what I mean? That, that the, he's, so only the pastor is able to give an answer when someone asks a question. No, you all are able to. You gotta just have to read the thing, right? That's all. You have to read the thing, study it, 
to have an answer. And as you study more and more, your answer is better and better. God will help you with that. Okay. Now, with that all said, um, I'd like to talk with you all for a moment about Wednesday Bible study. The uh, uh, Wednesday Bible study is not exactly uh, attended very well, to be honest with you. And frankly, the way to gauge the health of a church, the way to gauge the strength of a church, is the attendance of Sunday school and Bible study. Did you know that? Not, not the worship service, but the attendance of Bible study, the attendance of Sunday school. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when um, I was, I, I came across it by accident a, a few weeks ago. Um, someone was talking about how to know how much space you need for a church. They said, don't go by the attendance of services. Go by the attendance of Bible, Bible school. I mean, Bible study and and um, Sunday school. Uh, because you'll find, you know, a lot of stability there. So, to be honest with you, this week, I thought about lowering the standard, like the Steelers seem to have. You know, maybe we'll just not have Bible study. Um, but I can't live with that. Uh, you know, I didn't devote myself to being a pastor uh, so that I could do the bare minimum for the Lord. You know, I grew up with a bare minimum mentality. You know, show up for Mass, you've done your duty, go home, repeat the next week. Right? You, you understand, you grew up with that. Yeah. And, and that's sickening to me, to be honest with you. So we're going to do a couple of practical things to help out. Okay? The first thing that I'd like to do with Wednesday Bible study is change it back from 7 o'clock to 6 o'clock, like it used to be. Okay? Uh, I think maybe 7 o'clock might be a little late for, for folks. Okay? We thought maybe more people would be able to come at 7, but I think 6 might be better. Um, and, okay, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, we're going to have people... I would like to have people, let me put it that way, take turns watching children so that parents can bring, so that you all can bring your children, bring your grandchildren if they're with you, and someone's, you know, taking, watching them while we're studying. But we have to take turns with this, right? Um, and by the way, it's not junior church, so it's not like there's some prepared lesson. You know, it's not some, something like that. It could be, um, you know, coloring or playing a game or watching a video or something. You know, but just uh, Sandy's got a bunch of ideas about that. But I think, uh, I, here's my thing, is the, the difficulty I'm having is that we're having study, but it's kind of like um, a train going by a stop and there's and uh, there's no one there, you know what I mean? And and I, I I'm worried that the train is going by and people are missing it. And so so therefore I, I think let let's see if let's get four volunteer at least four volunteers, you know, to be willing to take turns, you know, so that it's only once a month. Now if we have more than four, then we you know it's even less frequently, right? But if we have at least four. So this week it's my turn to, to watch the kids. Uh, then the, uh, the others will be able to study. And I'll record it so that then you can listen to it, whoever's doing the watching. Okay? Um, but um, at least four who are willing. And Sandy's got a bunch of ideas, but I don't want Sandy doing it. Uh, she doesn't know I'm, a, I'm saying this, but I don't want her doing it. She, she uh, you know, misses the, the, the sermon every week and, and all. And so we need to have other people step up for it. Okay, so I'm going to put a sign up sheet over here on the, the thing there and um, think about it. And if you're willing to help out with that, that'd be great. But, but I want to hold off on Bible study until we get that because I don't want the train to keep going down the, without people learning. Okay, so we, we can establish, okay, now, at least practically speaking. Now, some of you might work during that time. 
And so, you know, you're just, you can't be two places at once. You know, have something else going on. But I want to remove as many practical things as we can so that as many people can come with you. Why? Because of what Paul's telling us. It's the knowledge, you know. Otherwise, who cares? You know, it'd make my job easier if I just showed up on Sunday, you know. Uh, but I don't want easier. I want what's right. So, uh, amen? amen. Uh, you with me on that? Okay, great, fantastic. All right, so let's uh, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, your word, and, and I'm so thankful for our church family. And help us, Lord, to be dedicated to learning, um, to study, um, to uh, 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 the love is here. Uh, absolutely, the love is here. Um, the way we love on each other and help each other and take care of each other. Help us to grow in that love as well and always be mindful of the importance of that love. But Father, help us to grow in your word. Uh, help us to um, uh, you know, uh, grow in virtue and knowledge and strength and, and, um, and patience and long-suffering. Um, help us, Lord, uh, so that we can uh, be ready with an answer and know what to do and know how to serve you. I praise you, God, for all you do for us. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our right. last song. Dawn, get up there. <laughs> 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 I'm formally changing his name. <laughs>
God, thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us to come and worship here in this wonderful house. We love you, God. We'd like to pray for anybody who wished they could have been here, but for some reason couldn't. In Jesus' name, we'd like to pray. Amen. 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 Amen.